The broadcast is now starting. Really happy to be here today to do this webinar <clears throat> and talk about cognitive issues in Parkinson's disease. I'm also going to talk a little bit as well about emotional changes that can occur. Um, I have to admit that this is the first time for me to do a webinar, so it is a little bit strange just kind of staring at the computer and uh, seemingly talking to myself, but um, hopefully you're, you're all out there, and I look forward to your questions at the end. So um, as a neuropsychologist, I frequently see patients with Parkinson's disease as we do have a movement disorder clinic here at the hospital at London Health Sciences Centre. And I typically get two types of referrals um, from the neurologists and neurosurgeons. So the first is um, from neurologists who are asking me to investigate cognitive, co sorry, cognitive functioning in an individual with Parkinson's disease. So often these patients have been experiencing some difficulties in their everyday life and either the patient or the family is concerned about those changes. So my job is to provide a detailed assessment and determine if the person does have any difficulties and what they are. So I will administer tests to the patients to find out if they're having problems with abilities such as memory, concentration, processing speed, um, and problem solving ability to name a few. So the second type of referral that I get is related to deep brain stimulation surgery. And before the surgery, a very routine part of the process is to assess patients to ensure that they're good candidates for the surgery um, from a neuropsychological perspective. So I will evaluate patients with cognitive tests and then offer my opinion to the neurosurgeon. So during my webinar today, I'm going to share my knowledge about the cognitive and emotional changes that I often see in patients with Parkinson's disease. And here I have a, a brief, just a brief outline of what I'll be covering today. So first, I'm just going to quickly review the common motor and non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease, um, just to give us some background. Um, then I'll talk a bit about what's actually happening in the brain to cause these changes. Next, I'm going to focus on the various cognitive skills that are often affected in Parkinson's disease, as well as the emotional changes that can occur. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I'm looking for when I assess patients who are candidates for the DBS surgery. And then finally, I'm going to end with a few practical tips on how to keep your brain functioning at optimal levels, um, which of course applies to all of us as we age. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure most of you know that there are four um, cardinal symptoms of Parkinsonism, um, and they're often used with discussing, they're often discussed with the acronym TRAP. So in order to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, a person has to show usually at least two out of four of these signs. So the first one is, is tremor, of course, so typically a slow tremor that occurs when the body is at rest. Um, R stands for rigidity, so really what this is, it's increased muscle tone, which results in a feeling of stiffness in the body. Um, A stands for akinesia or, or bradykinesia, which are really just medical terms for slowed or reduced movement. And finally, P is for postural instability. So this is the inability to main, uh, maintain yourself in a stable or balanced position, which often leads to difficulties with walking and also with falls. Okay, there are also some other, um, oops, sorry. There's also some other frequent symptoms that occur, and these would include um, the ones listed here on this slide. So hypophonia. Um, is, is really just a low volume of speech or a quiet, soft voice. This one's very common in Parkinson's disease. The second one is called masked facies, and that's kind of a strange um, term, but it's really referring to kind of reduced facial expression that people often have with Parkinson's disease. Then there's micrographia, and this refers to very small handwriting that you can see sometimes in a person with Parkinson's disease. Um, for shuffling gait is a common one as well, so character, characterized by small steps and lack of arm swing when walking. And finally, stoop posture, so the body tends to be stooped forward when a person is standing or walking. <clears throat> 
So we talked about the motor symptoms, but it is really well known now that Parkinson's disease is much more than a motor disorder. So in addition to the symptoms that are due directly to motor problems, there's also several non-motor symptoms that are very common. So for example, um, there can be sleep disturbances um, in Parkinson's disease, such as insomnia, um, something called REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and this is when people seem to act out their dreams. And by, by doing so, they may do things like jump out of the bed or talk in their sleep or just kick and thrash about. Um, normally during dreaming, your muscles are paralyzed, but in this disorder, the paralysis is absent so that the person can actually move around when they're dreaming. There can also be um, something called autonomic disturbances, which are really just abnormalities in the autonomic nervous system. So some examples of these would be effects on blood pressure um, or changes in bladder or, and bowel control. Um, so some auto autonomic symptoms that a person can experience would be things like fainting, lightheadedness, constipation, uh, or urinary urgency or incontinence. And finally, the other non-motor symptoms uh, listed on this slide um, really have to do with the topic today, which is cognitive difficulties and changes in emotional functioning. And we're going to get into these symptoms <clears throat> in a lot more detail uh, in a bit. Okay, so before we get right into the types of cognitive abilities that are affected, um, let me first talk a little bit about what is going on in the brain neuropathologically. So Parkinson's disease is, is typically associated with dysfunction of a brain structure called the basal ganglia, which is kind of the pink thing that you see um, on the diagram. And this structure is located uh, quite deep within the brain, and it's responsible um, for the initiation and control of movement, but it's also involved in a lot of other functioning as well. Um, in fact, it receives inputs from many areas of the brain and sends signals back out to other parts of the brain. And some of the most important areas of the brain that are connected to the basal ganglia have to do with, um, first of all, motor control, which is the, the obvious one. Um, but also, um, there are pathways involved in control of eye movements. Um, there's pathways in, in that control cognitive functioning, and there's also pathways that control emotional functioning as well. So this explains why a patient with Parkinson's disease can have such varied symptoms and not just movement problems. Okay, and in Parkinson's disease, um, I want to talk about what is actually happening within the basal ganglia uh, to cause all these symptoms that we're talking about. So there's two kind of primary problems going on in the brain. The first major problem is that there's a reduction in a neurochemical called dopamine. Um, and this is due to the fact that uh, neurons in the basal ganglia that produce dopamine um, are degenerating. And as most of you are probably aware, dopamine is a really important neurotransmitter which allows for brain cells to communicate with each other. Um, and it's the reduction in dopamine, which is a ma major reason for the symptoms that are experienced. Um, as you know as well, probably, that the main treatment for Parkinson's disease is levodopa, uh, Cinemet, um, some people know it by. And this is actually um, used to help increase the levels of dopamine within the basal ganglia uh, in order to try to make up for that depletion. The second problem that's going on in the brain is that there's an abnormal protein that's deposited within the brain cells um, in the basal ganglia and other parts of the brain. And these abnormal deposits are known as Lewy bodies. And the Lewy bodies make it difficult for the cells to function properly and are another reason for the symptoms that are experienced. So, as I said earlier, um, cognitive changes are a common non-motor symptom of Parkinson's disease. So, on this slide, I've listed the main cognitive domains or areas that are most often affected. Um, and these are processing speed, attention concentration, something called executive functioning, memory, visual spatial abilities, and language. And I'm going to go through each of these in a, in a bit more detail now. So the first one 
uh, I'll talk about is, is information processing speed. So basically, um, this is how quickly a, a person can complete a mental task, such as taking in, in information from the environment, making sense out of that information, and then responding to it. And it, this is actually kind of a tricky area to assess in Parkinson's disease because many of the tests um, that assess this skill require good motor control, um, specifically doing speeded visual motor tasks um, in which the patient is using a pencil. Um, but in Parkinson's disease, the ability to respond um, motorically is of course affected. So when I assess patients with Parkinson's disease, I try to use tests of processing speed that don't involve the use of the hands or using a pencil. And instead, I use tests that just require a spoken response. So in terms of, of how difficulties with processing speed would cause problems in everyday life, um, some of the examples I get from patients in this regard are, they might tell me that they have difficulty following a television program. Um, and it's usually because there's just too much information coming too quickly. So it's hard for them to keep track of the plot um, and all the different characters and all the stuff that's happening. Um, similarly, they might have difficulty keeping up with conversations because there might be uh, multiple people involved and uh, the information is coming at them a little bit too quickly. Um, sometimes people tell me that they have, it takes them a lot longer to make decisions or solve problems because their thinking is, is slowed down. And finally, just in general, um, I often hear from patients that they become overwhelmed because there's just too much information at once. And again, this is um, because of the, the slowed uh, processing speed that they're experiencing. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit now about attention and concentration, which is another ability that's frequently affected in Parkinson's disease. So this is the ability um, to focus a person's attention and cognitive resources on a, on a task, while at the same time being able to filter out other distractions or other things going on in the environment. Um, there's, all, there's actually different types of attention which are listed here, so sustained, selective, alternating, and divided. Um, an example of a problem with sustained attention would be difficulty following a long conversation without your mind wandering, um, or difficulty following this webinar without your mind wandering. Um, you're really having to sustain your attention for quite a long period of time. Um, Selective attention um, is the ability to uh, select and concentrate on only a particular thing while tuning out irrelevant things in your environment. So an example of having difficulty with selective attention would be maybe finding it hard to do a task such as a crossword puzzle um, while the television or the radio is on in the background. Some people get easily distracted by, by other things that are going on around them. And then finally, alternating or divided attention are the kinds of attention you need when you're trying to do multiple tasks at the same time. So an example of divided attention is multitasking, you know, things that, that we all do or we all try to do. Um, and I often hear from patients that their ability to multitask is affected. Um, so for example, um, it would be hard to cook and have a telephone conversation with someone at the same time because you're very, it's very, very difficult to do both, both things at once. Okay, the next cognitive ability um, I'm gonna talk about, and this one is very commonly affected in Parkinson's disease. It's called executive functioning. Um, so a definition that I use um, in my own practice is as follows, it's the ability to efficiently plan, problem solve, organize, and monitor one's behavior according to environmental feedback. Um, it really involves a lot of very high level cognitive skills, including things like problem solving, reasoning, organization, planning, initiation, mental flexibility, judgment, the list goes on. So I often explain this concept um, by using the analogy of an executive or a CEO of a company 
So uh, the person at the top of a, of a company is the person who has to do all the planning and organization for the company uh, and give orders to all the workers in order to make things run smoothly. They have to really think things through um, and they have to anticipate problems and they have to use good judgment. And when things aren't running smoothly, it's the CEO or executive who has to problem solve and troubleshoot all of the issues in order to find the solutions. But it's not just the CEOs that need these skills. We all need these kinds of skills in order to function well in our lives. So in terms of everyday examples, um, uh, problems with executive skills would include things like um, having difficulty solving problems that arise even in everyday life. Um, or diff difficulty reasoning through ideas or concepts. Um, showing decreased judgment in making decisions is also uh, a common thing that I hear about, uh, perhaps being more impulsive or not thinking things through. Um, sometimes another example is being less flexible or more rigid in thinking patterns. So a person might get stuck in one type of thinking pattern and have difficulty see, seeing someone else's perspective. Uh, and finally, another example um, is difficulty generating or initiating new ideas or activities um, is another one that I hear. Okay, we're going to talk about memory now. So um, this is, a, of course, a very important cognitive ability, um, and it's fairly complicated in that there's actually many different types of memory. However, in a nutshell, um, memory is the ability to learn or encode new information and then be able to recall it or remember it at a later date. So memory problems usually aren't um, too predominant early in the course of Parkinson's disease, but as the disease goes on, um, it's quite common to find uh, problems in two aspects of memory in particular. So the first is what I'm going to call efficiency of learning. Um, and it's really difficulty kind of getting new information into the brain. So a person with this problem um, will be able to learn new information, but it will just take them longer to learn it. Um, so in my practice, we test this by, by giving a list of words or a story to people, and we, oops, we do that over several trials. And what we're looking for is for a nice learning curve. So we want people to kind of get better and better every time we read the, the list or the story. And we do often see a learning curve in Parkinson's disease. However, the rate of learning is lower than expected. And the degree of acquisition or how much of the information that they ultimately learn is also lower than expected. So essentially, learning is just not as, efi as efficient as it used to be. So the, and the second type of, of memory problem is reduced ability to retrieve memories or learned information. So in Parkinson's disease, it's common that patients will have some difficulty remembering those lists or stories after about 20 or 30 minutes. But if I give them a multiple choice format, um, they'll often do much better in recognizing the information that they couldn't spontaneously recall. So this is what I mean by a retrieval problem. So the material has actually been encoded into their brain and there are memories for the information. It's just that the material is not easily accessible when they need it. So what this means that is in Parkinson's disease, um, people often take longer to learn new information and they take longer to recall information as well. And they will often benefit from cues and reminders as this does help them to locate the material that they did actually learn and store away. All right, this next one is a little bit harder to explain. Uh, it's called visual spatial skills. And these are a set of abilities that allow us to understand the spatial relationships uh, between objects. And it actually involves a lot of different skills like visual perception, um, depth perception, visual memory, visual attention, spatial orientation, et cetera. So there's a lot that goes into this. Um, real life examples of problems with visual spatial skills um, 
I have them listed here, um, one would be difficulty maybe putting something together like a piece of IKEA furniture. Um, so kind of understanding how all the parts fit together. Um, another example would be um, problems following a pattern when a person is sewing or knitting. Um, they have difficulty with that. Um, or even difficulty figuring out how to read uh, or use a map might be another, another issue. All right, and the last cognitive skill <clears throat> I'm going to talk about as being affected in Parkinson's disease is language. Um, and actually compared to the cognitive areas I've just discussed, language is actually not as, not as affected. However, later in the disease, people with Parkinson's disease can experience some changes in language, uh, particularly with respect to word retrieval and verbal initiation. So for example, um, word finding difficulties uh, can become more common. Um, so this is when you can't, just can't think of that word that you're looking for, or the name of a person, or the name of a movie, or an actor, et cetera. And it kind of goes back to that retrieval of information. It's really hard to find that information even though it, it, it's in there. You just can't get it when you need it. Um, and to be clear, this is actually a very common problem that we all have as we age, um, but it might be a, more pronounced in Parkinson's disease. Um, there can also be changes in we call, something we call verbal initiation, and what this means is one's ability to generate or come up with verbal material. So a person might not be as talkative um, as they once were, or might not contribute as much to conversations. Um, I've also included two other common symptoms which have an impact on communication in Parkinson's disease, um, but these are due more to motor abnormalities rather than cognitive problems. Um, so hypophonia, and I mentioned this earlier, is quite common. It's a reduced volume of speech, or a person has a much quieter, softer voice than they used to. Um, and as I ta talked about before, micrographia is this um, this tendency to write very small and have reduced motor control um, when a person's writing. So these two problems, they're not really language problems per se, but they can also affect ability to communicate with others. So you might be wondering, um, when does the diagnosis of dementia come into play? So there are two main criteria uh, for deciding when cognitive problems constitute a dementia. So first, there typically has to be impairment in at least two uh, cognitive domains. And by domain, I'm referring to the areas of cognitive skills that I talked about earlier, you know, such as uh, concentration, memory, executive functioning, et cetera. And the second criteria that you also have to have is that the cognitive difficulties have to show a significant impact upon complex daily living activities. So these would include things like keeping track of your schedule, remembering to take medications, uh, financial management, uh, being able to use electronic devices like a cell phone or a computer, um, and involvement in social activities. So for example, if an individual individual has some areas of cognitive impairment, but they're quite independent in their day-to-day -day activities and they're still doing fine with these complex daily activities, then they would not meet the criteria for dementia. And dementia, if it does occur, typically um, occurs later in the course of Parkinson's disease. Um, just from reading uh, the literature, the research indicates the average duration um, from onset of Parkinson's disease to dementia is about 10 years, but there can be a wide variation in that. So some patients can develop dementia much earlier than that, while others could take 20 or more years for that to happen. And some people never, never get dementia. Okay, so I'm going to change gears a little bit now and talk about some emotional and behavioral changes as well. So if you remember earlier, I mentioned that there are important pathways in the basal ganglia <clears throat> that are connected to parts of the brain that control emotions. So therefore, it's not surprising that Parkinson's disease um, can be associated with changes in emotional functioning. <clears throat> 
In fact, um, emotional or, or psychiatric changes are actually quite common in Parkinson's disease. And most patients will experience some form of these uh, difficulties during the course of their disease. And this can include a long list of issues, but some of the more important or some of the more common difficulties are the ones listed on this slide. So depression, apathy, anxiety, uh, perceptual alterations like hallucinations and delusions, um, and changes in personality. And there can be different um, reasons or causes for the presence of these uh, psychological disorders. Um, so first of all, they could be um, directly due to those neurochemical and other changes in the brain that occur with Parkinson's disease. So just the depletion of dopamine um, and also other neurochemicals can, can contribute to having things like depression and anxiety. Um, the problems can also be due to a psychological reaction to having a chronic illness. And this makes sense because um, it's, you know, it's a very difficult thing to, to have Parkinson's disease, and it could just be a psychological reaction to that. Um, another um, cause could be medication side effects. So we'll talk about that a bit later as well, but there's a lot of medications um, um, used for Parkinson's disease that, some, that can sometimes have an effect on the emotional aspects of things. And finally, it can be a combination of the above. So all of those things could be contributing as well. So I'm going to talk briefly about some of these emotional changes now. And we're going to start with depression. So one of the more common emotional symptoms is depression in Parkinson's disease. And some studies uh, that I found estimate that about 40% of patients um, have some degree of depression um, with, their, with their Parkinson's disease. Um, brain changes in, in the disease are thought to have a significant role in causing the depression, but like I said, it could also be due to, in part, to the psychological reaction. Um, some of the more common symptoms of depression are listed on this slide. So just having a low mood and feeling sad, um, having reduced enjoyment of life, a loss of motivation and interest in things. Um, sometimes people have increased irritability or anger, and that's a symptom of their depression, feelings of hopelessness. Um, and depression can also impact on um, other sorts of behaviors in our lives. So they can, it can impact on sleep. It can impact on our appetite. Um, it can also impact on our cognitive skills. Um, depression can have a significant effect on things like memory and attention. Um, and it can also impact on our energy level and cause fatigue. Um, I understand that the next webinar is actually on depression and Parkinson's disease, so I'm sure you'll all be learning a lot more on this topic uh, in the near future. So uh, I want to talk now about apathy, um, and this is another quite common emotional symptom in Parkinson's disease, and it can be defined as a lack of feeling, emotion, interest, and concern. Uh, an apathetic uh, person shows little activity, um, they're, they're not very spontaneous, they don't usually initiate things, and they might seem indifferent to things around them. They might appear withdrawn or even aloof. Um, in most cases, um, the patient is actually not even aware of these changes, and rather it's the family or the caregiver that becomes aware of it. Um, it's also important to be aware that apathy is not the same as depression and it can exist independently without depression. So someone can be apathetic but not necessarily be sad or depressed. And similarly, um, while apathy often does occur in depression, um, it's not always a symptom of depression. And this, this uh, symptom can be very troubling um, for families and caregivers. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it can be mistaken for depression, um, although it is not necessarily depression. Um, it can even be mistaken for laziness. Um, but it's important to be aware that the person with apathy doesn't really have control over that problem. It's instead a behavior that's just directly due to the, the problems going on in the brain. Um, 
Apathy um, can have a significant impact on the patient as well because it could lead, for example, to less physical activity, um, fewer social interactions, um, even problems taking medications because they can't initiate that, um, and just being able to participate in everyday activities. Okay, just like depression, anxiety is also quite common in Parkinson's disease and in fact often occurs with depression um, at the same time. Again, it can occur in 40 to 50 percent of patients. Um, the anxiety issues um, can be more of a general nature, such as uh, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, where people feel anxious for no particular reason. Or the anxiety can be more specific and be tied to certain situations like being out in public is a common one uh, or doing a particular activity. Uh, some of the uh, symptoms of anxiety would include things like feeling nervous, um, worrying a lot about things, um, just a sense of feeling jittery, um, having a racing mind or an unsettled mind, um, or having episodes of panic as well. I'm also going to briefly mention a couple of other behavioral changes <clears throat> that are sometimes reported in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, so the first one is, is impulsivity, um, being more impulsive and increased risk-taking. So in some patients, um, this can happen. Um, and for example, some problems that can arise are things like compulsive gambling, compulsive shopping, um, or even sexual behaviors that are unusual for the, for the person. And sometimes this could be a, uh, a side effect of medication um, like we talked about before. So um, one of the, the medications called Mirapex or uh, Pamaprexol is, is known to sometimes cause these kinds of impulse control problems uh, in patients. Um, and as with all medications, it's very important to, to look at side effects of them. Um, there can also be alterations in perception, uh, perceptual alterations like hallucinations and delusions. So hallucinations, just to define what that is, is it's when someone sees or hears things that are actually not there. Um, and in Parkinson's disease, the hallucinations are often visual as opposed to auditory. So it's, it's things that they're seeing and they can be quite complex. They could um, talk about seeing people or animals, for example, that aren't there. Um, in contrast to a, a hallucination, uh, a delusion is a strongly held belief that is, that is not true or accurate. Um, and these aren't as common as hallucinations in Parkinson's disease, but they can, they can occur. Um, an example of a delusion would be um, a common one is believing that there's someone living in the house when uh, clearly that's not the case, like a border or something like that or thinking that there's um, a spy living in the neighborhood. So those kinds of things. Um, these alterations in perception and thinking can also be a side effect of medication as well. All right, so in, in terms of treatment for these issues, I think it's important to talk about what can be done about them. Um, there's a number of options. So first of all, medications um, can be very helpful, um, but again, it's really important to know um, that patients with Parkinson's disease and older patients in general can be very vulnerable to the effects of medications um, that are used to treat these emotional problems. Um, so for example, some medications um, that might help with hallucinations can actually make the motor problems worse. And some medications for depression and anxiety can have adverse effects on cognitive functioning. So the treating physicians um, have to be really careful to review all the, the medications that a person is on and make sure that adding a new medication doesn't have an adverse interaction. Um, because as I said, there can be serious uh, side effects. Um, another treatment um, option um, is psychotherapy or counseling. So 
um, this can be helpful to patients to help them cope better with the emotional symptoms and therapists uh, can suggest new strategies and techniques to help them cope better. So things like relaxation training or meditation, um, they can help them um, with things like sleep problems and pain management as well. Education and support groups are also um, also helpful for people with emotional uh, difficulties. Um, sometimes just obtaining information and becoming educated about, about these things helps. Um, and people often find it helpful to attend support groups um, and interact with other people with Parkinson's disease who are going through the same thing. Exercise. Um, I'm going to be talking about this again later, but um, it's great um, for our physical health and also our cognitive functioning. Um, but there's also evidence that exercise has a really significant impact on mood um, and emotional functioning as well. So for all these reasons, um, I would encourage exercise um, as, as part of a treatment um, for, for these difficulties. And then finally, um, improvement of, of sleep and diet um, can also help with emotional issues in some cases if these are problems in the person's life. Okay, we're going to move along now to a totally different um, topic. I'm going to say a few words now about deep brain stimulation um, surgery. So I do want to let you all know that I won't be able to answer detailed questions about this as I'm not a neurosurgeon. Um, and I would recommend that you do ask your, your neurologist or your neurosurgeon such questions. But I will give you a quick overview of this type of surgery um, that's becoming increasingly common in Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to talk um, more from the perspective of neuropsychology on this. So I, I frequently get referrals from neurosurgeons um, for patients who have Parkinson's disease who are being considered for this surgery. Um, and as you, you probably know, um, the surgery is often considered when the medications for Parkinson's disease are no longer effective or when people are starting to have significant side effects from long-term use of, of levodopa. And some of the side effects that people will experience um, include uh, something called dyskinesias, which are pretty disabling involuntary movements. Um, they might have uh, sudden on-off fluctuations from the medications. They might have quicker wearing off of the medication. They might have problems with freezing as well or dystonia. Um, so for all of these reasons, at that point, the surgery might be considered. Um, the surgery itself actually involves implanting an electrode into a certain targeted site in the basal ganglia, as you can see in the, um, the picture here. The electrode is connected to a neurostimulator, which delivers electrical impulses to the target, and this hopefully uh, results in improvement in the movement abnormality. Um, the electrical stimulation presumably helps because it disrupts the abnormal patterns of neuronal activity. Um, after the surgery, the stimulation can be really fine-tuned and adjusted to, to maximize the best functioning for the patient. So before the surgery is cleared to go ahead, um, there is a, a pre-surgical evaluation that's done to make sure that the person's going to have a positive response to the surgery and also to make sure that they're not going to have um, uh, problems after the surgery. So DBS is generally considered a pretty safe procedure uh, and it doesn't often cause significant side effects, but there are definitely risks involved in the procedure, um, such as stroke or, or bleeding in the brain or seizures, um, as well as impact on cognitive functioning and emotional functioning. So neuropsychology assessment is part of the routine process in deciding whether an individual is a good candidate for this surgery. So here um, are some very general uh, criteria that neurologists and neurosurgeons look for when considering someone for DBS surgery. So this is from the perspective of the neurologist or neurosurgeon, first of all. 
So first, the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease has to be pretty definitive, um, and the symptoms have to be clearly responsive to medications that increase dopamine. So that's the first thing. The second thing is usually the motor symptoms have to be pretty disabling um, and impact on the quality of life for the person. They also want um, to take candidates in which the motor symptoms are not responding well to the treatment. So again, as I mentioned before, often um, with the patients that I see, um, they, they can have significant disabling side effects from the medications like the dyskinesias that we talked about. And then finally, uh, the patient should not have any other critical illnesses or brain dysfunction due to other causes. So, for example, if the person also has a diagnosis, oops, if the person also has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, they would probably not be considered a good candidate for the surgery. Now from a, a neuropsychological perspective, um, these are the kind of criteria that I would be looking for when I see a patient. So generally speaking, we would not want patients to, we, or sorry, we would want patients to be functioning re relatively well with their cognitive functioning and not meet criteria for dementia. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, first of all, we want the patient to be able to have good decision-making capacity as they are undergoing a really complicated surgery. So we wanna make sure they can understand everything about the surgery and, and give consent to it. Second, um, the patient is actually awake during the surgery and has to respond to the surgeon um, and therefore needs to be able to understand questions and accurately respond back. So for example, when the surgeon is stimulating the brain to make sure uh, that the electrode is placed properly, he'd be asking the patient what he or she is feeling or whether there's any change, changes in their movement. And the third reason that we um, <clears throat> don't want people or candidates to have a dementia is that um, those who have a dementia or have really significant cognitive problems are gonna be at a greater risk for further cognitive impairment following the surgery and we don't want to make things worse that way. However, having said all of that, um, I think it's important for you to know that having some cognitive difficulties without a dementia does not rule out the surgery. So in fact, many candidates for surgery do have some degree of neuropsychological difficulty that, that I see. Um, a second criteria that we look at um, is people undergoing the surgery should not have significant mental health issues such as severe depression or severe anxiety. Um, and because if you have those kinds of symptoms, it can also be linked to negative outcomes following the surgery. Um, history of significant problems with gambling or risk-taking behaviors or impulsivity could also be an issue. Um, again, giving, given how common these mood symptoms are, we would not disqualify people just on the basis of a few symptoms of anxiety or depression. But if the symptoms were at a really high level, we would have more concern. We also want people to have good psychosocial support going into the surgery. So for example, we would hope that family members or friends would be available uh, to be with the patient um, during the, the, the surgical period. Um, we also want patients to have lots of help as they return to the hospital for all the follow-up visits as well. And finally, we want people to have reasonable expectations for the surgery and be aware that it's not a cure um, for Parkinson's disease. Um, so we want to hear from patients that they don't have unrealistic expectations. Um, and we also want to ensure that patients appreciate both the benefits and the risks of the surgery. Okay, here is my last slide. So I want to end on a positive note um, and, and tell you what you can do to maintain optimal brain functioning. Um, these tips are, of course, applicable to all of us, whether or not we have a condition such as Parkinson's disease. And there's been a lot of research to show that these three things that I've listed here are very helpful um, to achieve the most healthy state of our brains. 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about these three things. Um, first of all, first and foremost, exercise. I've already mentioned this as being a great thing. Um, many studies have shown that it's very helpful for brain functioning um, and reducing the risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, in fact, some studies have actually shown improvement of cognitive functioning in older people who exercise. Um, and, and it certainly doesn't have to be at the level of, of a, a training for a marathon. Um, even just regular walking is great. Um, other suggestions would be things like swimming, yoga, tai chi, um, resistance training. Um, and there's some suggestion that combination of aerobic exercise that gets your heart rate up and resistance training, so using weights and strengthening, both of those things together are usually better than just one alone. Social activity, so staying connected and engaged with other people also helps your brain. And if you think about it, when, when you're with other people, you have to listen to them closely, hopefully. Um, you have to respond. You have to interpret social cues. Um, it's actually a pretty cognitively demanding activity to socialize with someone. And it challenges your brain, and it, it also helps with, your, with mood and emotional well-being as well. Um, and again, studies have found that there is a higher risk of dementia in people who are socially isolated and don't have regular contact with family and friends. So it's important to socialize with friends and family. Um, if possible, do things like join a social group or a club, uh, take a class, uh, volunteer, etc. And finally, mental stimulation um, is the last thing I'll talk about. Um, many studies have shown that older people who keep mentally active will show a reduced rate of cognitive decline and a reduced risk of developing dementia. There's even some evidence that doing mentally stimulating tasks may increase um, connections of, between the neurons in the brain and increase overall brain volume. So that's pretty amazing. Um, some examples of mentally stimulating activities would include things uh, like playing challenging games like chess, shown in this picture, um, or joining a book club, taking a community course, uh, learning to use a new computer program, et cetera. I mean, there's many, many different things that people can do. And the key seems to be that it's better to do multiple and varied cognitive activities as opposed to doing just one thing for a long time. Um, and once an activity becomes too easy or routine, then you, sh you should switch it up and, and add something else to the mix. So if um, somebody says to me, well, I do Sudoku every day and I've done that for 10 years, then that's probably not really helping anymore because it's become too easy and too routine and it's not challenging your brain. So it would be better to come up with some new ideas. Um, so, you know, when you look at all of these, these three things, um, uh, it would be great to do something like join a senior center uh, as a suggestion because it might offer all of these things. It might offer exercise classes. Um, obviously, there'll be social activity going on and there'll probably be um, uh, things going on that will challenge someone mentally as well. Um, and group exercises are excellent because they combine both exercise and social involvement. So the more things that you can do along these lines, the better. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Gloria Grace. That was such a wonderful and very informative uh, presentation. I do believe uh, not only did I get a lot out of it, but I think everybody online today uh, certainly did as well. We do have a couple questions already. Um, we do have one gentleman that asked, what are the statistics for prevalence of dementia in Parkinson's disease? Okay, that is a good question. Um, I'm just going to find my sheet that has some of that information on it. Um, so uh, prevalence of dementia, the studies that, I've, that I was looking at when I was preparing for this talk, um, most of them threw out numbers in the 30 to 40 percent range. So if you look at a community sample of people with Parkinson's disease at any given time, about 30 to 40 percent of those people would be considered to have a dementia. Um, 
other information, like some studies, there, there's, there's a huge range. So some studies say 10%, some st studies say 80%, which seems really, really high. But as I said, overall, it seems to be about 30 to 40%. Okay, and then um, we have one lady who's had a husband um, diagnosed with Parkinson's at age 45, then had DBS at 54, but after DBS noticed that there were some symptom changes such as cognitive impairment and cooking and driving um, and had their license taken away. So she was wondering, um, even if you don't have DBS surgery, would you still have dementia? That's a good question. Um, and the answer to that is, on, well, again, you don't necessarily have to have a dementia as time goes on. As I said, um, some people don't. Um, but the longer that you have Parkinson's disease, then the higher the risk of dementia. So um, unfortunately, Parkinson's disease is a degenerative disorder, which means it gets worse over time. So even if you don't have the DBS surgery, um, you're, you're going to notice changes. Um, and like I said, that there are risks with the DBS surgery. So again, I don't know the particular circumstances for, for this, um, this person, um, but it could be that maybe the surgery um, caused some additional difficulties or maybe it, it, it's a case that those problems would have occurred anyway. It's hard to say, but, um, but certainly as the disease goes on, the risk for, for increased cognitive impairment and uh, even dementia is, is higher.